belt. And this no. meeting is being recorded. Mm -hmm. So anyway, okay, you have good. these three factions and it's political and everything, but it's science fiction too. It's good. Good. It's it's like near future uh, science fiction. Yeah. It's like a good weekend binge. There's a lot there. <laughs> Mark, where did you get the Star Trek background? I want one. I just found it online. If you do, uh, I put uh, bridge uh, TOS and I found awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to see everybody. Let me uh, get us started. Glad you guys are all here. We got about 34 people. So our, our, uh, our guest speaker, is on, but I think he's he's uh, doing something at the moment, and he will join us in person at about uh, quarter to eight or so. Um, please don't be offended if I mute you if you if you get a little loud in the background. So it's just to, just to keep us going here. So without further ado, let me get started. So welcome to the January meeting, everyone, of the Astronomy Section, Rochester Academy of Science. My name is Mark Minerich. I am your president, and I'm glad to be here with you guys in this first week of January. So here's our agenda for tonight. Well, welcome, everyone. I got a bunch of announcements. And our... Um, our featured talk will be by uh, Matthew East of L3 Harris, and he'll give us an update. He, Matthew spoke to us uh, about a year, not quite a year and a half ago, about what was uh, the potential missions that were, some of the missions that were going to be up for review for the decadal survey. And tonight he's going to give us the results and what, the, what is going to be scheduled for the, uh, the next 10 years. So every, every 10 years, NASA pulls all this information together on what's going to be and what the potential missions are. And they choose the ones that they're going to use for the, for the next 10 years. It'll be funded for the next 10 years. So that, that's what's come out now. And we'll see what those are. OK. All right, so is there anybody that this is their first time to a uh, astronomy section meeting? It's here, here uh, virtually. Yeah, this is Jim Martin. I'm new uh, about two months now. I want to. I want to thank uh, Jim uh, Cedarwin for uh, the advice on my mount. I finally ended up getting a, a CGM uh, uh, 11 mount uh, for my uh, Celestron 11 inch uh, after my other mount crapped out. So uh, yeah, I found it used online and all that. And Tom too. Uh, thanks for talking with me. Uh, I mentioned to uh, Mark also, uh, Dan. Uh, Kuchka, I think his, his name is. Uh, we're going to get together as well. But, and then uh, uh, Bob uh, Easterly and Bob McGovern. Uh, Bob McGovern, especially for showing me around down there. A phenomenal site. You guys got a tremendous legacy and, uh, you know, a very, very helpful group of people. And uh, so I'm very impressed right from the get go with everybody. So thank you. The important thing, important thing is when the uh, virus gets let. Uh, goes down a little bit. We'll show you the best chicken wing joints in Rochester. That's part of the trip. <laughs> That's part of the tour. <laughs> no, thank you all. I, I do appreciate all the help so far. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome, Jim. Glad to have you aboard. Anyone else? All right. Devin, speak up. I'm sorry. Wait, I just hopped on the meeting. I'm Elspeth. Hello. Hi. Yes. This, is, this, Hi. Is the, this is your first astronomy section meeting. How did you find out about us? Um, I I just kind of did a little research on the internet some time ago. I've actually been part of the society for the last about six months. I've just been my last semester was so hectic that I just haven't been able to make it to any of the meetings. So okay. This is my first one, and I actually came on campus um, <laughs> to find the link because I missed oh. the email. So, and it's okay, it's fine. Okay, I'm, well, I'm glad, Doc, glad Dr. Richard put the note up then because I, I sent him a note earlier today. I said somebody's going to show up. So, thank you for uh, glad you saw it. Thank, and thanks for joining us. Glad to have you. Yeah, happy to be here. 
Anybody else? First time here? Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Devin Joffrey. I'm actually a friend of David uh, Bishops. I am from the Buffalo Astronomical Association. Um, and this is my first time at your meeting. And I'm kind of here because I want to hear what L3 Harris is going to uh, announce tonight. So thanks for having me. And I hope everybody's doing well. Awesome. Thanks for coming, Devin. Anyone else? Yes, this is Tom Reese. This is my first meeting. Um, I heard about the club through Marty Pepe. Uh, Marty and I worked together for a number of years at Xerox together. I'm glad to be here tonight. Oh, fantastic. Glad to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Tom. Anyone else? Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Glad you're here. Uh, typically, we meet on uh, the first Friday of the month, and it's and it's in person when we don't have these screwy, screwy conditions we're in, but uh, we're able to compensate by doing things virtually. So welcome virtually to our uh, our first meeting of 2022. And this is typically how our start. We'll start our meeting. We'll find out who's the first time here, and then uh, we'll kind of go into observing, which we'll talk out talk about next, and we'll talk. We'll do some announcements and stuff that's going on. So. Uh, anybody do some observing in the last month or so they want to talk about? I put up a picture here that Doug Kostick took of a very thin sliver of Venus, which is incredibly bright. If you look at, look at after sunset or right at sunset, that's how much of Venus we are seeing <laughs> that is incredibly bright. So, Doug, when did you take that image? That was New Year's Eve at 5 p.m. And how low was that to the horizon? 10 degrees above the horizon. Yeah. So you have, a, um, you have a significant amount of chromatic aberration there. Are you, are you showing that picture? It's it's in the uh, it's in the presentation. Am I not sharing the presentation? Oh. Am I not sharing the presentation? I, I don't see anything. Or not. That's, uh, oh, here we go. That's better. Oh, OK, that's better. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right, thank you. Nice That's better. I forgot to get a picture of the cave telescope. It looked ridiculous, pointed 10 degrees above the horizon. You probably probably were looking at the side <laughs> of the building as much as you were looking off in the distance. <laughs> but the weather's looking good. I'm going to give it one more try, but at home tomorrow at noon. All right. And then, and then he. The Venus becomes a morning star, a morning planet. The conjunction, five degrees away from the sun. Fairly regularly before the pandemic. Fantastic. Get rid of Sunday yeah. skip, and then, of course, singing became like bad and very unsafe. So we. Anybody else do uh, do some observing of late? Uh, I managed to see the meteor shower in December, the Geminid meteor shower. Yes. Unfortunately, um, you know, I'm still. I haven't actually had a chance to properly try like astrophotography, so I mean, I'd love to learn how to better do it. Um, but we, my, I took one friend out with me. Um, it was really cold that night, but I saw how clear the sky was. And I was like, this was the first time in like two years, now like nearing three since I've tried seeing this meteor shower and it's been, you know, nice enough to see it the moon though did kind of have an effect on what we could see but we still saw so much we saw some awesome um i don't know showers for lack of a better word yeah um, i saw some i was out that night mark it was a really nice night oh uh, i missed it i missed it i completely spaced on this uh this meteor shower there, i was at um uh, Honey Oak Lake Park, and there are other people out, and it was really cool to hear the oohs and ahs from. Wait, people. I was there too. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's wild. It's a nice spot to view. Yeah, I go there just about every single time when there's a meteor shower, you know, and the sky is clear enough to see it. There was a group of people on a big tarp. That wasn't you, was it? That was. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> I was the guy on the left side. Oh my gosh! Great. I was thinking in my head that'd be so funny if this guy is part of the, the like you know the, the astronomical astronomical society and everything. And wow, small That's world. Great. Yeah, <laughs> it is a small. I got a few world. nice pictures. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> I just went outside like around three 
three o'clock in the morning and um, <clears throat> and I saw her about five in a, in a half hour. And that was enough. I was like, okay, you know, this, I always feel so, you know, strange, you know, being out in the middle of my yard in the you know, front yard in the middle of the night, like looking up. How was the moon at that time of night, Vicki? <clears throat> you know, I didn't even see the moon anywhere. So oh. it, it was below, you know, like the houses and trees. It was okay. pretty dark. It still hadn't it was risen. Good. I, I think set. it said around, I think it said around three, three thirty okay. or so, Mark. It already set. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was good. And Not like I said, like we all said it was nice yeah. out. I completely <laughs> was out of my mind. I might have been busy with other stuff. Who knows? It was warm for a December yeah. night. So yeah, it was. It was the meteor shower of the year, no doubt. I ended up seeing 45. Wow. Oh. Where, where are you looking at? Awesome. Just actually behind my house in here, here in Fairport. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Mm -hmm. 45 and how long? Uh, about two hours from about really? two to four. Wow. So I'm a little crazy, you know, crazy astronomers. Mm hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Any other? Uh... Any other uh... observing? I have an interesting observing uh, note. Uh, in another week, I should have an image. Uh, my granddaughter Lily was uh, is part of a NASA program for uh, plotting uh, the the variable rate oscillation rate of pulsars. And we were down visiting them for the holiday, for the uh, Christmas holiday. And she has access to one of the big scopes in Arizona. So I had a chance to sit in on one of those sessions and look over their shoulder. And uh, they processed probably four nights worth of all nights worth of images. And she says I should have one in about another week. So the minute I get a reasonably decent image, I'll share it with everybody. But her professor, uh, this is a graduate level project and her professor has given her total access to everything, including, and she's just an undergraduate, a junior. So I just can't believe that uh, they've opened the door for her, but she's going out of her mind. She's pulls all nighters three or four nights in a row when they give her the window on the scope. That's great. That's so That's I'm, great. I'm hoping to uh, be able to share some decent results. She says it's going to take them about a week and a half to process their images, but she's got a stack of them. Oh, that's 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 an astronomer's dream. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, she I, I just can't tell you how proud I am of her. She's she saw the notice on the bulletin board and says walked into the professor and say, I want a piece of this. And here it is. It's a graduate level project. That's awesome. He kind of laughed at first, but then he thought about it. He says, hey, that means you're going to be around a while. I, I'd like you to join. Yeah. And uh, they've they've given her the keys virtually. That's fantastic. Good for her. That is great. Who was it, if I could ask, who was it that said they were part of the, that Dave Bishop's friend, part of the BAA? Uh, Devin was. Devin, okay. Well, you want to go to the meeting next week at the Williamsville? Yes, yep. um, actually, I do uh, planetarium programs there at the Williamsville Space Oh, lab. fantastic. Then yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look to see you face-to-face, -face, I hope. Yeah, yeah, and then I'll, I'll have a program in February for one year. Great. On Mars. Yep. Great, great, great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, everybody. You're asking about EAA, is that what you're asking? Yes. Experimental aircraft? Uh, no, this was the Buffalo Astronomical Association. Any other observing stories anybody wants to share? All right. So recent events, we had the holiday extravaganza at the Strasburg Planetarium. I wanna thank uh, Steve, uh, Ventress and the folks at RMSC for letting us use that. We had a really nice turnout. I think we had 85 plus people there, mask vaccinated. And we had quite the evening with food. We had a regular meeting. We had a nice talk from Dan Schneiderman, which was some of the images you see here. We got to see the uh, black holes. Oh, we had a member images program that was awesome. I really liked the way we were able to do the member images some of them full dome. That was a lot of fun. If you weren't there, you missed a you missed a pretty pretty awesome night. Um, and it was hard to capture that. And <clears> as a result of that night, I uh, I, I solicited um, some help with Zoom because it's very difficult with 
too many, so many things going on to, to capture all of the, uh, all of what's going on in the background with being present at two places at the same time and in a meeting and then a virtual meeting at the same time is a little difficult. So, and I've actually got some help with that uh, going forward. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a little better at doing the, 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 the hybrid type meetings. Yeah, if it's a vir simply virtual or simply in person, it's very, fairly simple to do. But when you do a hybrid meeting, it's a little tough. And we learned that there. But going back to the holiday extravaganza, it was a fantastic evening. And I want to thank everybody that participated in, in helping serve food, doing raffle tickets, uh, cleanup, uh, all that stuff. It, and it came off very well. And thanks again, Steve and uh, and. Uh, RMSC for letting us do that. That was a, it was an awful fun evening. It was really good to see a lot of people. And uh, for those of you that were there, we, you know that we actually had somebody that uh, tested positive for COVID a few days after that. And I let everybody that was at the event know this. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, no other person reported getting, uh, having come down with COVID. I know some of several people tested themselves to be sure, uh, but because of us being masked and distanced and being very careful with how we handle food, nobody else had an issue. So uh, very glad that that happened. So. I would like to compliment you for your foresight because I think those kind of things are important. Uh, I know some schools are going all virtual, but right now RIT is gonna be live, but they're requiring everybody students and faculty to have both their shots and their booster in order to qualify to for on site. Yeah. So I know it's kind of crazy and I'm, I'm, you know, not much we can do about it, but at no. least we can no. go through the, I know there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road for it, the next it's, couple it's of months. Kind of, and Marty, it's kind of expected this because this is, uh, this is right after the holidays. A lot of people yeah. get that aren't typically together a lot of traveling happens and so that you're bound to see this spike happen so it happened and hopefully it, uh, it dies down and we, we can come to a little better yeah that's what I'm, I'm hoping by the end of the month or through maybe next month that it'll abate because it makes uh, for a real difficult time at school sure does sure does thanks marty Everyone, can I just um, say hi to somebody else that's here from the Buffalo Astronomical sure. Association, our president, Mike Humphreys. He's, um, I see his moon um, right there as his uh, icon, but he's the president hey of the BAA. And um, he's also a friend of, uh, he's soon to be a good friend of David's as well. They, they've been talking to. Uh, yeah. Hey, Mike, Great. welcome. Yes, thank you. I'm just hiding out over here, peeking over the wall. Okay, thanks, Mike. <laughs> what, glad to have you here. Great, yeah, and I'd like to try and do some, and maybe between all of us, we can start doing some hybrid meetings with our group and your group. Um, nice. I know it's two meetings a week, but that'd still be great because we can get all kinds of speakers. So looking forward to it. That'd, that'd be great. That happen. We can make that happen. Let's exchange emails. And we'll, uh, Absolutely. We'll Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so coming up, here's some, some, oh, actually, before we have stuff coming up, I we heard from the uh, Heroes Brewing Company uh, as a result of the uh, the milkshake IV, the Nebula milkshake IPA that they made for promoting us as a nonprofit organization, uh, they sent us a check for one hundred twenty dollars. So that was wow. that was a quarter for every can that they sold, and they sold it pretty much. They sold everything they made, and so they what they do is they 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 pick charities and they uh, they pick they picked us and. Uh, then we, we kind of collaborated on what the, of, of the stuff that they were going to be brewing, what would be a good one to, to, to pick. And they had this milkshake IPA that they, they thought about the name. And, uh, so we, we, this is the label that was on that can was the uh, Nebula milkshake IPA. It's kind of a, uh, if you're into this, it's kind of an orange vanilla, almost like a creamsicle type of uh, milkshake IPA. Very, uh, it's actually a double IPA. It doesn't, doesn't say it on this label, but on the, the label that came out as a double uh, milkshake IPA. And the alcohol content was just slightly more like 7.6%, something like that. But it's pretty, it's pretty light for a double IPA. And it was a lot of fun to do this. We had got to get together there. But I want to report to the club that we actually got $120 out of it and a lot of publicity. You can't actually read the, the label on there, but it does give a little description of our site, of, of, of us and uh, 
and our website is on there as well. So it was a nice little gesture by a local guy to uh, help another local nonprofit like us. It was a lot of fun to do. So thanks very Mark, much for Hero Brewing. Mark, do you know if uh, it's handled at some of the beer stores at all? No, this was strictly through the uh, through their tap room. Ah. And a lot of the local guys are like that. There's, there's so many local breweries that uh, it's, it's very, very difficult even in production to get into some of the stores if you're if you're much more yeah. local brew. This is, this no, I was just wondering if uh, if when they do another batch if who I have to see to get some being out here in Buffalo. Oh well, you could t talk to me. I might be able to get just one. I had I okay. a case of it. So <laughs> okay, well then put put me in for a six pack for sure. Well, you get a four pack. How's that? Okay, four pack. Yeah, fair enough. So upcoming, we're going to later this month, in fact, two weeks from tonight, I'm going to host a uh, Mies virtual tour. Mies is the uh, observatory for the U of R. It's actually used by, uh, by students and graduate students to do actual uh, or, or mirror what you would actually do for, for scientific experiments using this telescope. And you learn the, the techniques that were used to to do, to do these things. And one of the things you can do with this scope is you can actually image supernova. And what, what you need to do to measure supernova is to accurately image so that you have a, a brightness quality that is comparable. You take, you take an existing star, you image it, and you know what the brightness is of that star. And by using the, the brightness of that star and stars in your image, you're able to tell how bright the supernova is. And so Dave Bishop has given me a supernova and I'm gonna look that up. And what we're gonna do is we will image that supernova using the scientific method. And, and we will also try to calibrate those images while we're on as well. So this will be virtual and we're not gonna be doing this in person. I'll be doing this virtual. I can actually control the, uh, the telescope right here from my desk. That should that's be the 21st? The 21st, Friday the 21st. I don't have a time yet. Okay. Um, the supernova David gave me is in the constellation Botis, and I think that rises a little bit later than seven o'clock. So, uh, more to come on the time on that. Look for, an, look for an email on me, and we'll uh, we'll uh, make sure that, that you guys have a good time for that. So, I will be in the next week or so figuring out what that looks like to uh, for timing on that. But that should be a lot of fun, and you guys can see me struggle through trying to do imaging at the same time. <laughs> If a better candidate pops up, I'll send it to you, Mark. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that, Dave. That'll be a fun thing to do, just a virtual thing to do. And, and guys from Buffalo, you're glad to join us. Glad to have you join us as well. And you can laugh at it as a, and I'm not the best astrophotographer, but I do know how to use the Mies telescope and spin it around and take images and that kind of stuff. So we will. Sounds like it'll be a blast. It will be. <laughs> of course, Mark, it's weather dependent, obviously. Obviously. And so if it's, uh, it, if it looks like it's going to be crappy and I, and I can do another night, I'll do that. It's it really going to be time dependent because if it's, if it's something that we're going to be at 11 o'clock getting started with, you know, that you got to be a pretty patient person. So, but that's, that is how astronomy is done. Just ask uh, Marty's granddaughter, right? Yeah. She went to bed at nine 30 the other night yep. in the morning. <laughs> yep. yep, exactly. All right, more upcoming stuff. We have uh, we have our February the next the next uh, meetings coming up is we have our board meeting uh, the first Wednesday of the month. That's February second. Uh, typically, we meet at U of R. We'll also do this virtually. I think last one we did virtually by consensus. That's the second. Our next uh, general meeting, monthly meeting, is Friday, February fourth, and we're going to have two talks that night. Um, the first will be a short talk by Kelly Douglas of the University of Rochester. If you recall, Kelly, in December of 2020, or December of 20, yeah, 2020, spoke to us on uh, the dark energy spectros spectroscopic instrument. And actually, uh, Kelly is part of the team that is running DESI. And so we're going to have her do a short talk on the progress of what's going on with the, De the DESI project. So probably about a 20, 20 minute, half hour talk on uh, DESI, give us a progress update on that. And then our feature speaker will be Mika Nakajima, who's a planetary scientist from U of R, a protege 
of um, uh, Anna Quillen, who, who's also we've seen before do a lot of talks on uh, planetary uh, 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 astro uh, planetary astronomy. Uh, I'm not sure what Mika's uh, dedication is as far as what what she if it's formation or just what's out there now. But she's also a geologist, which gives you kind of a, a two a two pronged attack on uh, planetary scientists. So I'm looking forward to what Mika will tell us about uh, what she's doing with uh, uh, planetary uh, astronomy. So a lot of action in the, the February meeting. Also in February, so this is all happening all in the same week because the, the new moon is that same weekend. We'll have observing on Saturday the 5th, weather dependent, and then we'll have an open house on the next day on Sunday. Uh, certainly this will be the first weekend of February, which would make it prime for sledding down that big hill which would be a great uh, opportunity if, if there's snow to do sledding during that open house on February 6th. So a lot of action. Is that there. Super Bowl Sunday, Mark? Yes, but this is during the day. It's an earlier in the day. Super Bowl doesn't start till really the Super Bowl hype doesn't start till about six o'clock. So you are correct, Nick, that is Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, Tony says that per Stellarium, Arcturus does not go to 30 degrees until 2 a.m. Ooh. We'll see how high we'll see how high it is in Bodhi's, Tony. I'm not sure how uh, how high that is because it's a it's a long constellation. We'll see. If you're worried about having enough snow, I got about a foot and a half here. I could ship you some. <laughs> yes, I heard you got a lot of snow, Marty. <laughs> All right, and then up, then we're going to have another event, and we haven't scheduled this yet. I have a tentative date that I proposed. Uh, and this is uh, part of a winter lecture series, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the uh, how the Mies operates when, in live in person on the tw the 21st of this month. But uh, uh, Professor Watson, who is intimately involved with the conversion of the Mies telescope to remote operation, uh, will give us a talk on what they did to to make this remote. Because literally, if you look at the center of the screen there, that's a little. That's I have that on an app on my phone, and I can actually look at each of those little cameras to look at the uh, you know where the scope is pointing and declination and right ascension. I can look at the outside of the building. I can look at the top of the scope to see if the cover is open. I can look at the bottom of the scope to see if the camera's there and the camera the camera's uh, spinning when I when I tell it to turn a certain direction to, or to put the the uh, to, to rotate it into the into the proper uh, orientation to image. Uh, there's the, the computer console actually at Mies, but that will be actually controlled remotely. And we'll have Dan talk about what all the stuff that happened and why they made that stuff happen to make it remote. A big, big issue with it is because it was really not uh, in, in, in conformity with uh, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. You, can, you can't get in, there's all these stairs and stuff, and it's a very, inex fairly inaccessible place. But by making it remote, now anybody can get at the, the telescope and use it. So pretty cool stuff going on there. And Dan will give us a talk. Tentatively, the date is uh, for Friday the 18th, seven o'clock. That's two weeks after our February uh, meeting, but uh, we'll, I asked, asking Dan to do this, we'll do it as he's available to make that happen. And then upcoming, so here's the next few uh, meetings coming up in March. We'll have uh, Judy Piper as our speaker, uh, prof uh, pre Professor Emeritus of uh, University of Rochester. In April, Dr. Richmond and uh, and three of his grad students will give us uh, research summaries of, of stuff that they're doing in April. And then in May, one of our favorite events is uh, Dave Bishop's Astronomy Year in Review, where he goes through uh, 100 or more. He does a lot of them. I don't know how many he does normally. A whole bunch of things that happen in astronomy in the year, little, little uh, bite-sized stuff of, uh, of things that have happened in the year in astronomy. Always a really interesting session with Dave's astronomy year review and then i wanted to put out there a uh, save the date so we we decided that we would like to have our racha star fest on the weekend of july 22nd that's a friday and 23rd it's saturday that is our our preferred preferred date to do it that is a uh, 
believe, let me just real quick check my notes. That is a third quarter moon. It's not exactly a new moon, but the moon won't rise until 214 the next morning. So it's uh, it's not like, unless you're gonna be doing some really serious astrophotography, it should be a nice night for, uh, for doing observing if it's clear out July 22nd, 23rd. And we have a secondary date of August 26th, 27th, which would have been the same weekend that we had planned it for last summer that didn't happen because the Delta variant canceled us. But that'll be our secondary date is August 26th, 27th. Not gonna announce our speaker until we know that we have our speaker lined up. But uh, if, the, if one date works better for our speaker than the other, we'll certainly move it from one to the other. Uh, but right now we're planning on August, or excuse me, July 22nd with a secondary date of August 26th. So uh, if you wanted to put that in your calendars to figure out uh, if you have to, to uh, figure out work schedules or whatever, you have some uh, some dates to work with. But I'm looking forward to doing this doing this live in person and for Rock to Starfest. All right, a um, couple last things here. So membership renewal, uh, all of us have, uh, we've rolled into a new year. So uh, if you have not renewed, please do so. Uh, Craig Kaplan is our membership chair. He is not here tonight as he is uh, trying to find his way back from visiting his visiting family in Sweden, actually. Uh, but he should be back soon. But if you have not, please send in your, uh, your renewal. You can do this via PayPal very simply, or you can mail a check and send it to the post office box and uh, Craig can get you renewed for your membership. Or if you wanna join us, this is available as well. Uh, this, this form is on our website. Uh, it's also in our newsletter. If you wanna see our newsletter, we're glad to send you a copy of the newsletter and that, that's in there as well. Any questions on membership renewal? And then lastly, we have uh, upgraded the keys. Mark informed us. Sorry? I'm sorry. We've upgraded the keys and the lock sets on uh, just about all the buildings at the Ferris Center. So if, uh, if you have a key now, it will not work because, because the new keys are set up and you need to be a current member. Your form doesn't show the PayPal fee. And it was just a... The, the form that I showed on the uh, on the presentation was just an old form to, just to show that it was it was time to renew. But the form you saying the form on the website doesn't show it, Roger. The form on the website doesn't show the the fee, Roger. I'll move on. Um, so yeah, to be, uh, to get a, if you, if you want a key, you should be a member in good standing for, for two years and then, uh, let Roger know that you're interested. Um, or we can make exceptions in the event that you're, you've been an active member and, uh, you make an appeal to the board directors, we can talk about it. So we'll make that happen in, in those situations. All right, with that, I am done. Any questions for me before I turn it over to Matt? The only thing for the, those of us that are remote, uh, do you want to send the keys or, or what? You decided that? Uh, Marty, I can address that. Um, um, Bob McGovern attempted to send the keys, but the post office has changed their policy. He can't put it on a card and mail it. It's got to be a custom package. He's got to do oh, package boy. shipments and everything else. So it's fairly costly for us to do that. Wow. Uh, we will try to work out something if yeah. you've got a scenario. So. Yeah, well, I'm uh, probably going to be on campus a couple times a week. So if we could figure out a drop spot, sure. then that'll work. And and Bob's got a drop spot. So work it out with him. Yeah. But we're not yeah. planning on mailing them out because of those issues okay. we're running into. Wow. Okay. Thanks. So, so certainly if we, um, if uh, Marty, if you're going to come out to the site, I'm nearby. And if I'm, if I'm nearby, I can get you in there or even have your key. If we know you're coming, I can, we can get your key to me because I'm nearby to get you, get you your key. To do that as well and, and in february certainly we hope to be meeting in person in february bob will be yeah. there with you in february well yeah. mine's obviously weather dependent so i mean that's a little different yeah. story but uh you're right yeah you're right around the corner i i understand yep, yep. thank you and, 
And Doug, uh, Doug's going to hold our uh, our firehouse site for July, July 22nd, 23rd. 23rd would be the key date. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate that. All right, Matt, I have you queued up. Are you here? Yes, I am, Mark. All right. It's all yours. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be with you all. Uh, I'm Matthew East. I'm a lead astrophysics mission architect with uh, L3 Harris Technologies in Rochester. Uh, I'm here today more as a uh, amateur astronomy uh, astronomer and an enthusiast and uh, someone trying to share uh, some of the exciting developments of the decadal survey for the 2020s. Uh, the National Academies of Sciences have been working for uh, several years now uh, to prepare this report and plan out the next decade of, of investments. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. That's okay. Uh, looks like that's disabled for me. Um, let's see. Let me see. As agent co host, let me make sure I can. Uh... Oh, you know what? Let me. Uh... He also has his video turned off. No, no, no. Let me, uh, let me find him here. All right. For some reason, I lost you as co-host, so we will get you back in there. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, that's coming up. Uh, here we go. This looks good. Let me know when you're able to see my screen here. We can see your screen. We can see your screen now. Okay. Wonderful. So, uh, getting a little background noise. Uh, if you could please mute. Um, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, about a year ago, I, I spoke with you folks and, and shared uh, the four mission uh, concepts that NASA was developing. Uh, the first one being HabX, uh, that was a four meter uh, habitable exoplanet hunter. Uh, so trying to find Earth-like planets around other stars. And uh, that was a very impressive, ambitious system. Uh, the second one was Louvoir. Uh, they had an eight meter and a 15 meter version and could do some really impressive stuff. Uh, this is what a, a synthetic uh, you know, picture of our solar system would look like if, if you were uh, looking at it from a, another uh, star far away and, and you can see Earth, Venus, Jupiter. Uh, that's what it would look like through uh, Louvoir. And you can see uh, it's good for things in the local neighborhood too. This is an uh, image of Pluto, what you know, the Hubble Space Telescope can do and how that compares to what Louvoir could do. So, so some really impressive, ambitious things. Um, the other two, there was an X-ray uh, telescope, a follow-on to Chandra and, uh, with, with much more capability and, and surface area. Uh, and then there was Origins, which is a uh, far infrared version of, of James Webb. It goes much colder down to four Kelvin or, or three Kelvin or so. And uh, Origins would be able to see much farther into the infrared and, and be much more sensitive at some wavelengths, in some cases, uh, you know, 10,000 times more sensitive than James Webb. Uh, so NASA developed these four really impressive mission concepts. I was lucky to, to be involved with uh, developing those and, and working with those teams. And the decadal survey, uh, just announced in November uh, what, what their selection is for the next flagship mission for NASA. And the reason this matters is uh, this same decadal survey selected uh, Hubble, Spitzer, Chandra, James Webb, and uh, in 2010, the, the Roman Space Telescope, uh, known then as W first. Uh, so, so really great track record with recommending uh, missions that have been fully funded from the decadal survey. Uh, so they have a voice that actually matters. And uh, even, even uh, NASA policy requires them to, to follow uh, the recommendations of the decadal to some degree. So uh, you know, this is a very important report that's going to shape astrophysics investments for, for the next 10 years. Um, so out of these four missions, what did the decadal survey select? Uh, they selected uh, something of a hybrid between the first two, Louvoir and Habax. The, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read the conclusion here for you. 
Uh, they recommend a high contrast direct imaging mission with target off axis inscribed diameter of approximately six meters. So it's right in between the four meter HabX and the eight meter Louvoir. And it provides an appropriate balance between scale and feasibility. Uh, such a mission will provide a robust sample of 25 or so atmospheric spectra of potentially habitable exoplanets. Uh, so 25 or so Earth-like planets they expect to uh, sample. It's going to be a transformative observatory for general astrophysics. And given optimal budget profiles, could launch in early 2040s. So uh, they realize that this is so ambitious, it's not going to be done by 2029. Uh, they've realized that uh, a lot of technology investment and development is needed leading up to this. Uh, to do something uh, so challenging. Uh, some of the key features of this is they, they want a 10 to the minus 10 level of contrast. Uh, so to, to see an exoplanet with that, that degree of contrast, uh, the uh, analogy that's used is, is usually uh, if you're in New York City and you're looking at a uh, firefly in uh, uh, Los Angeles, and someone turns on a bright spotlight shining right at you that's right next to that firefly, um, you need to be able to see and detect that, that firefly and directly image it. So that's the type of contrast that's, that's needed uh, to make these observations, uh, that you know, factor of uh, 10 billion or so to one. So really challenging stuff. And I'm, I'm gonna share some of the, the specific challenges with uh, making a space telescope that can do that. Uh, it's it's you know really a, a fun thing to be a part of, but uh, it's a, a bit daunting at the same time. Uh, I'm I'm gonna you know offer if if at any point here you folks uh, have questions or uh, comments, you know feel free to just jump in with questions on the fly as as we go. So uh, there's two ways to do this, uh, this, this type of imaging of exoplanets or Earth-like planets elsewhere. Uh, one way is uh, if I go back to HabX, they have this thing called a starshade. And the starshade is, is a separate spacecraft that flies, in, in the, their case, uh, 77,000 kilometers away from the telescope. And it literally blocks out the starlight so you can see the planets uh, zip uh, orbiting around the, the distant star. And uh, the star shade is, is really uh, exquisitely shaped and, and precisely shaped to uh, you know, have the right diffraction effects where you can see the planets, but reject almost all of the light from the star. And uh, the trouble is if you want to go look at a new target and you've got this thing thousands of kilometers away, you actually have to move the two spacecraft with respect to each other to go look at a different star. And that takes time. You gotta accelerate and then decelerate and line everything up. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. Uh, the other option is an internal coronagraph, which uh, would be living inside the, the aft optics of the, the telescope in one of the instruments. And uh, Louvoir depends on an internal uh, coronagraph uh, they call it Eclipse is their system. And I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about how that works. Uh, I've got a reference video here from the Roman Space Telescope. It's, it's a, about a one, one or two minute video. And I'm hoping this will work so, so you folks can see how an internal chronograph works. And uh, this one, you don't have to move two spacecraft around and, and it can work immediately and go point at all sorts of different stars. Uh, in, in short order uh, by comparison. Let me know if you're getting the sound on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause this. Can you hear the sound from the video? Yes. Only barely. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to turn it up if I can. So just barely hearing hearing the sound here. I think we're hearing it from your speakers. Yeah. 
You're going to have to do a sound through your computer if you go up to the top. Okay. There's a way of doing that under view options or okay. options. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we can do that. Uh, okay. Uh, let me give it a try again now. Uh, can you hear it? Well, uh, one second. Let me on is a way to see distant planets hidden is that by the glare of the star they orbit. Yes. The chronograph yes. reduces the light coming oh. directly from the star to separate it from the light reflected by the planet. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope's chronograph doesn't block the star's light with an opaque disk as a simple chronograph might. Instead, it uses a combination of disks with complex patterns and light-blocking stops to create destructive interference with the star's light effectively making it disappear while allowing the light from planets to pass through. A complicating factor is that the light picks up small distortions as it reflects off the telescope's series of mirrors, and these distortions can reduce the effectiveness of the destructive interference. Collecting more light increases the image signal, but the planets are still hidden under blobs of leftover, distorted starlight. To remove these blobs, the coronagraph has special deformable mirrors that can change shape by using hundreds of tiny pistons. This corrects distortions in the light beam. As the mirrors deform, the blobs of light slowly begin to disappear, revealing brighter planets. Further adjustment brings fainter planets into view. Advanced software processes this data, further improving the contrast and clarity of the image. This processing makes objects more than a billion times fainter than the star visible. As a result, the Roman Space Telescope will provide the first look at individual planets in star systems that might be similar to our own. Okay, so uh, ho hopefully the audio came through on that. Uh, that is a, a summary of how the, the internal coronagraph works. and. Um, one of the key things they mentioned is uh, any aberrations that, that come from the light bouncing off of the mirrors and the telescope uh, kind of challenge this system to, to achieve the contrast it, it needs to. So uh, if you have mirrors that aren't sitting perfectly still and perfectly stable and uh, maintaining the exact shape, uh, you, you start to have aberrations and it prevents you from getting the, the high contrast measurements and, and actually seeing these exoplanets. Uh, so uh, part of uh, my job uh, has, has been to figure out how do you make the, the telescope and the mirrors stable uh, as is needed to, to make these observations. And I'm gonna share a little bit of, of work that, that I've done in that area. So this is a, a presentation given at uh, SPIE uh, a couple of years ago on ultra-stable mirror assembly design. And uh, it is basically asking, well, how do we make mirrors so stable that uh, we can take these images of exoplanets directly? Uh, and I had a great team of people uh, helping me on this, uh, Conrad Wells, uh, Dr. Wells, and, and Chris Sullivan. Um, in, in the process, I'm kind of going to give a crash course in, in why is it hard to, to make a, a space telescope. Um, for you know the mirrors being made, uh, you need to balance a lot of considerations. Uh, uh, it, for, for these exoplanet observations, you need wavefront stability. So the, the mirrors have to sit still on, on the degree of, of uh, order of picometers over a handful of minutes, which is, is a really challenging uh, requirement since, uh, you know, uh, picometers is, is a unit of distance that's shorter than the diameter of an atom. So uh, to hold that still uh, is, is, is a really challenging thing for a system that's many meters across. Um, some of the other things that that limit our designs and, and tell us what we have to do and what we're not allowed to do is, is cost and schedule. Uh, there's, there's only so much um, you know, cost and schedule that can be allowed in our, our designs. And uh, we need to you know, credibly uh, present that. 
Uh, for example, James Webb has had some overruns which have uh, you know, caused it to, to have the launch date pushed out year after year. And that's something we can't do with future missions. So we have to be sensitive to that and have a credible plan. Uh, another thing to consider is mass. Uh, if you make your, your optics too heavy, you're not gonna have any mass left over. Uh, the, the launch vehicle can only carry so much. So you're gonna have to start uh, kicking out instruments. You may lose a spectrograph, you may lose uh, you know, an infrared instrument. Um, you may lose all sorts of things, but if you can make your uh, mirrors very lightweight, you can save mass and maybe have more instruments or, or more uh, advanced instruments on board for, for sensing. Uh, another thing is we need to make these optics uh, pretty darn good. Uh, even at uh, you know, ambient conditions on the ground, they have to be uh, good to within uh, nanometers. So uh, those requirements don't go away. Um, this six meter system that the decadal surveys recommended, uh, it's uh, not much bigger than the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, is on its way to L2 now, which is a, a quiet, stable place where this future mission is, is likely going to live also. Uh, but it, its diffraction limited wavelength is about five times shorter than James Webb. So that means all of the optics need to be made to tolerances that are five times tighter. Um, the, the whole telescope has to be aligned to tolerances that are about five times tighter. Uh, so there's, there's a great deal of challenge. It's, it's not like doing James Webb all over again. Uh, there's uh, you know, much tighter requirements in some ways. So uh, how do you make all this possible with design? Um, and and you know, what does it really mean to achieve this stability? Uh, here's a little table here that it tells you how many picometers of, of different Zernike terms. Um, Zernikes are types of errors. So um, you can see in this table, you can tolerate 23 picometers RMS of segment power. Uh, that's, you know, power is, is the same type of aberration you get from turning the focus knob on your telescope. Um, you can only tolerate, you know, a fraction of the diameter of an atom of, of that type of aberration and uh, so on for uh, these segments in a mirror. Um, so how do you get something to stay still and be that stable? And, and how do you guarantee that? Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to guarantee. Um, the, the place we started was, well, let's look at all of the physics phenomena that could impact stability and could uh, keep the, the mirrors and the telescope from being perfectly still. Uh, we came up with a, a notional design and uh, put together a, a model of, of the mirror assembly that, uh, that, that we designed. And we put together a, a small uh, basic spacecraft model uh, to, to analyze thermal environments. And we use these models to figure out how all different physics phenomena are going to affect our uh, stability and our ability to keep the system staying perfectly still. So uh, one thing we looked at is sun, earth, moon, gravity effects. So as uh, things are orbiting each other, the distance between uh, the telescope and these, these other bodies, these massive bodies is gonna change. So the gravity environment is gonna change on the order of uh, micro G's of acceleration. Um, you know, what is that gonna do to the stability as, as the gravity is changing up there? Uh, that, that's one question we asked. Uh, there's hygroscopic effects where um, you launch something and on the ground it's in relative humidity of, of whatever the ambient air is. And uh, once it's up there, it starts to dry out and uh, moisture and volatiles escape and they'll, they'll leave composite structures and adhesives and uh, those things will change dimensions and they'll warp over time. Um, very slowly, but enough to matter when you're looking at the, the picometer scale. Um, we looked at, you know, what happens to metals with creep. We looked at uh, thermal loads that happen over time. Uh, you can't be uh, staying at the perfect temperature at, at all times. There's always going to be some changes in temperature. Um, and that could be because you've decided to point at a new target and you're pointing at a different star and because you slewed and you, you know, changed your azimuth or elevation or, or whatever, 
uh, you have a new view factor and a, a new radiative environment to your uh, sun shield that protects you from the sun. So you've got this new uh, environment that's driving the temperatures to change. So how do you deal with that? Um, so we, we tried to figure out how all of these different uh, physics phenomena could impact stability and uh, you know, which ones are easy, which ones are hard. Uh, is it even possible to, to make a telescope this stable? So a uh, really difficult questions to, to answer. Um, one thing we did is we looked at a telescope we're, we're helping work on now, the, the Roman Space Telescope. And uh, we're really looking at the mirror assemblies and the glass and the mount pad down here. Uh, this uh, chunk of things uh, highlighted in green in the bottom right. And uh, we, we wanted to see if you know, these things impact stability and we, we didn't focus so much on structures and the, the support structure for the secondary in, in this specific study. Um, one area of, of technology that can really help out because there's a, a thermal a stability is, is a big challenge is uh, millikelvin thermal control and starting to hold temperatures very tightly with uh, actively controlling them with heaters and thermometers. Um, and, and, you know, some of the challenges as you try to control temperatures very, very tightly and make it very, very quiet is uh, the, the heaters are driven by electronics and, and the electronics have noise and, and they're not perfect. Uh, another, another problem is uh, if you slew from one star to another and you're, you're looking in a new place, uh, all the temperatures want to change and it's going to take hours and days for uh, things to settle down and get quiet again thermally. So uh, it, it takes a lot of patience and there's some tricks we can play to, to maybe make things stable more quickly. And uh, the, the thermal responses of the hardware and, and how you design the hardware is, is important too. Um, this little plot on the right, it kind of describes if you get a really massive thing, uh, the, the mass acts as a filter for you know, changes in, in temperature. So if you've got a heater, if you imagine like a, you've got a light in your room and you flick the light switch on and off, uh, and you've got a thermometer sitting on the table right under the light, uh, you could probably imagine the thermometer is going to go up and down pretty quickly right when you flip the switch on and off, and you can kind of see that. Um, if you put your thermometer and uh, put it right inside a big chunk of glass or metal or, or what have you, and you go and flick the light switch, uh, you're not gonna see the temperature change right away. It just takes a long time because uh, you have to heat up all that mass. So uh, some of that you can use to your advantage uh, when, when you're trying to hold things stable. Uh, so here, here's an example of some of the analysis that uh, I, I performed to, to predict what's gonna happen with these, these uh, different temperatures and uh, different uh, sources of instability. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out on the left what the adhesive is doing to the mirror over time and uh, what the uh, metal uh, creep uh, of, of invar that's using the, to mount the mirror, what that's doing over time. And on the right, it shows some of the different mirror substrates that uh, how, how they might perform. If you need to make a bunch of different mirrors to make up a big six meter primary, and you got to make a, you know, let's say you got to make 60 uh, one meter segments and put all those hexagons together, uh, sort of like James Webb. Um, they're not all going to be perfectly identical. Uh, some of them, each each little piece of glass is going to be unique. Uh, and and folks at Corning in Canton, New York, and at Schott in Mainz, Germany, uh, they've been doing their best to perfect the art and come up with the most perfect materials for for telescope mirrors but uh, they still haven't achieved perfection. Uh, each one's gonna be a little bit different and they're gonna have a different response to temperature, which is gonna have to do with, with the stability we see uh, in, in our thermal environments. Uh, so another activity we've been working on is, is predictive thermal control. We work with uh, NASA Marshall on this and uh, the, the real idea is uh, if you know the, the slew that you, you did in, in, in your telescope pointing at a new target, if you know the temperatures uh, used to be you know, distributed a certain way and you know, they're gradually going to drift and, and 
you know, settle down to a new state. Um, if you know where they're going to go and where they're going to settle, can you just pump the heaters real, uh, real fast and, and real hot and get them there faster so that they settle down and, and get to that uh, steady state more quickly. So that's, that's part of the idea of uh, predictive thermal control, which is a, a tool that we can you know, use machine learning and AI and stuff like that to uh, kind of educate the uh, thermal control system. Uh, this chart is just a little bit on uh, you know, some of the different technology opportunities that, that we looked at to improve uh, stability. And, and the bottom line is there's, there's no one technology that solves all of our problems and makes a telescope stable. Um, you get a bunch of different technologies working together and they all play a different role in, in you know, making a stable system. So uh, a lot of our estimates, we were surprised that uh, we actually think this type of stability that's needed on the order of picometers, uh, we think it's achievable. Um, part of the reason is it's time bound. Um, if you needed to hold something you know, stable to the order of picometers for uh, days or weeks or months, uh, there's no way you could do that. Um, but because of the way the, the, the coronagraph system works, uh, if you've got something that's steadily drifting in one direction um, and it's predictable and it's uh, just drifting, uh, you can subtract that out. Uh, if you get something that's uh, maybe thermal and it's uh, speeding up or slowing down over time, uh, that's a bit more difficult to deal with and it's, it's dealt with differently. And uh, if you look at a period of you know, hours or days, uh, you, you may see a lot of movement, but if you only need it to stay still for a matter of seconds or minutes, um, you know, all of a sudden these small uh, values are, are much more achievable. So uh, we actually think this can be done. Uh, we think this, this six meter system that the uh, decadal survey recommended is, is something that's achievable and that they're actually gonna be able to directly image Earth-like planets with that six meter system. So. I, I'm really excited that they recommended it. I'm really excited that uh, we may have a chance to, to work on it and, and contribute to the, the future of uh, astrophysics and uh, learn something new. So I'm really happy to be a part of it and, and share this with you folks. So uh, I'll, I'll open this up to any questions. So feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, is, Matthew, is that, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry, Matthew, it's Devin uh, Joffrey. I just had a quick question. Something you said in the beginning about James Webb, did you say it was 10,000 times more sensitive or 10 times to, to be in the future? 10 times or 10,000 times more sensitive than JWST? Oh, I was comparing uh, Origins uh, Space Telescope and JWST. And uh, yes, in, in, in a few particular bands, it, it's about 10,000 times more sensitive, uh, the Origin system. Wow. And it's because of how cold it gets. Wow, okay, thank you. Other questions? Let's see if I got any online here. Let's Can see. I ask if a copy of this presentation is available? I I think this is a public domain, so I, I think I can. Uh, distribute a copy. Uh, maybe I can do that via you, Mark, if, if you're okay with that. That's fine. That's fine. That'd be great. Do you mind if we take this back to Buffalo? Sure, I'll share it with you guys as well, certainly. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you for that. It, uh, it was, it's pretty thorough. Uh, what you're going through, going down to the glue deforming the, the mirrors and each mirror being individually calibrated. That's a, it's a lot of really tight work. Um, and you have pretty, pretty certain that this, this can uh, really perform to that level, huh? I, I think there's, there's no way to 
you know, promise, you know, something that, that is going to sit still uh, to a degree that's, that's, you know, shorter than the diameter of an atom. There's no way to promise that or guarantee it. Uh, but, you know, the only way to, to build any confidence is to look at everything under a fine tooth comb. And uh, that's, you know, the, the, the approach we've been taking. Well, just think about the outgassing discussion at those temperatures for things like RTV alone. I mean, that, that in itself is a mountain, is a huge variable. That's right, and it's going to be doing, uh, you know, day one when the you get first light and that you, you get to see your first picture, uh, that outgassing is going to be doing something, and then a, a couple years later, once everything's you know calibrated and you're you're in the thick of your science collections, that outgassing is going to be doing something different on you possibly, um, so uh, a lot of so challenges. That, that one element alone is a, is a critical you know mission uh, critical. Uh, item. That's right. Matthew, a, a question, Matthew. The, I, we, I know we have on, a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Can, can I give this one to Matthew? Um, the question I saw is the, looks like some of the time frames were 2030 launch and so on. Is there a um, part of your prediction as far as the life, life of the unit out? Is it going to be a 10 year life? Is it going to be, um, do they have thoughts on, on how long it's going to be out in the, out in space? operable i th i think they would uh take a similar approach uh, as they did with hubble so uh and and chandra uh, both of those i'm for uh, lunch <laughs> well exceeded exceeded their life expectancy and you know they've gone multiple decades and i think that would be the hope here but i think the design life would be shorter like five or ten years and with the expectation that you know, everyone's conservative and over-designing. Uh, this is Dave Bishop, just as a side note on uh, Chandra. Chandra got into trouble and they called one of the engineers at L3 Harris to help them out. You remember who that was, Matt? It must have been Keith Havey. Havey, yes, that was the name, Havey. So there's a couple of questions in chat. Douglas asks, do the segments do the segments alignment need to be maintained or are they fixed? Absolutely. Uh, the segment alignment uh, needs to be maintained at, at this same level of stability too. So um, you know, we can't have a, a perfect mirror maintain a perfect shape and say that we've, we've done our job. Uh, we got to keep them all aligned too. Another question from Jeff says, do we need to target solar systems that are relatively free of dust and gas in order to get the coronagraph to work? That is, older star systems. Scattered light would be a problem otherwise. That's an interesting uh, operations uh, constraint. And uh, I, I could imagine that's there, there's some real phenomena there that could stop us from observing certain things. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with work done in that, but I'm, I'm sure someone has thought about it. Uh, a lot of folks have been uh, planning for this mission because uh, each you know, minute of observing time is gonna be so valuable. Uh, even with the Roman Space Telescope, once it gets up there uh, with its coronagraph demonstration, uh, I, I think folks have thought about that. So I'm gonna do some research on that just to, for my own interest. Yeah, Dr. Richmond says most of the good candidate systems are close enough that there is little interstellar material between us and the target. Yeah. Other questions? I could imagine with with that challenge, uh, you know, with the the analogy of looking at a firefly in Los Angeles from New York, um, you know, imagine introducing a whole bunch of fog in between the two places, and yeah, I could I could see some difficulty with that. So, uh, Dr. Richmond asks you, how old will you be if the proposed six meter system launches? 
be in my rocking chair. <laughs> well, they do say that our uh, our uh, lifespan is getting longer, just a matter of how, how much longer, right? <laughs> See if I'm lucky, I'll I'll be in my fifties. There you go. <laughs> well, hopefully, we won't be in a rocking chair then. <laughs> Matthew, uh, Bill Rogers here. What is the target position in space? Uh, you mean the target of the the objects that this is going to be looking at? Well, like for uh, J um, James Webb is L two. Where where do you have this? Expect to have this in position or positioned in space. And what are the weather conditions out there like that? Uh, so I think this is going to be an L2 also. Oh, okay. uh, just like Webb and Roman, it, it's a very quiet place to be. Sure. Uh, so you imagine you want to be in a quiet place when you're uh, uh, trying to stay stable. Um, that the, the, the weather there, <laughs> there is some, you know, there, there's certainly radiation considerations. And, and that's another thing that, that we looked at in this study was, um, the way we represented it was a, a pressure on the, the face sheet that, you know, the radiation may create a small, you know, micro pressure on, on the surfaces of the telescope. And, you know, that, that could cause some stability effects. Uh, we don't have a, a good answer uh, as to, you know, if, if our, our sun shield and, and our environment is going to protect us from those and, and, and maintain stability. Uh, we, I think it was further down our list, uh, you know, closer to least concern than most concern. Um, but, but that was something that we thought about, at least for a little bit. I, I see you referenced finite element modeling. I guess you, you're using that in designing the mirrors? Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of designing the mirrors and, and figuring out how sensitive they are to each of these, uh, these physics phenomena that you know, metal uh, modeled in these these color plots here. Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful slide. <laughs> well, uh, okay, let's see. If, if, if I'm gonna, if I could t uh, tag on to Bill's question about L2. So when it gets to L2, does it does it go into some kind of an orbit there, or is it kind of put in one spot and it stays there? Uh, my understanding is is it goes into an orbit there, uh, a pretty uneventful orbit. Now, when you mention more sensitive than uh, James Webb, is this meaning that it's more sensitive to uh, the infrared radiation, or uh, so, in what sense? So, in that case, I, I was talking about the four different mission concepts that, that NASA developed. And I was talking about origins, which was the, oh. the far infrared one. Um, this one's gonna be more sensitive in, in a different sense. Uh, it's not gonna be much bigger than James Webb, but, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna dig deeper into the visible wavelengths and the ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, oh. So- The other uh, side, huh? <laughs> that's right. So <laughs> Hubble is, you know, has a surface quality that's about five times better than James Webb. And the, the alignment of Hubble is about five times better than James Webb needs to be. And, and this is going to be, you know, the size of James Webb, but it's going to have the, the tight uh, optical requirements that Hubble had. So it's going to put those two things together and get down to the UV. Ah. And the expected budget requirements? Uh, it's it's going to be similar to a, a Hubble or a James Webb. It's going to be in that class. It's going to be among the, the biggest things we've ever done. Interesting. Thank you. We have Welcome. a couple more questions in the chat. Yeah, so, so Tom asks, is there an empirical understanding of the uncertainty terms mentioned in the summary of the presentation? So uh, empirical understanding, I'm... I'm uh, there's some uh, flight data from, uh, say, thermal environments of, of past missions, and, and we know, uh, you know how well uh, temperatures are controlled on Chandra, for example. So there's, there's certain you know, bits of data we know from, from past missions. Um, but I'm glad you asked that because it gets into one of the biggest conclusions down here on, on my summary page which is that uncertainties are dwarfing the best estimate predictions uh, for, in this case, it's talking about STOP, which is structural thermal optical uh, uh, performance. 
And uh, the, the message is, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you want to claim that something's stable to a, to a certain degree, um, and you have models that predict that those models are, are have some uncertainty and uh, you can't claim that something's going to be stable below a, a certain threshold it, just because your prediction says it's, it's, it's so um, you need to make sure that, you know, the plus or minus on that prediction, you know, you're still staying under that threshold. And in this case, the, the plus or minus uh, the uncertainties are actually uh, much larger values than than the types of uh, disturbances that we're predicting. So, you know, if we're predicting uh, one picometer, uh, the uncertainty is plus or minus 10. So I, I can't guarantee anything better than 11 picometers, if, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, they are fictitious numbers, but uh, hopefully that makes sense. Bob asks, with the Unix computer operating systems rolling over in the year 2037, is there plans for that issue on both in space and ground equipment? It sounds similar to the, the uh, 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 December 31st on, on uh, 1999, uh, the, the Y2K type of phenomena. Um, I don't know. I don't know that that uh, I'm more of a mechanical background than a, um, a software and, and electronics. So I, I actually I can't know that. that. That's actually the 32-bit uh, um, time variable inside C, and Unix computer systems are based on that. And yeah, there are plans to move that to a 64-bit number. Interesting. I didn't even know that was an issue till now. <laughs> Uh, Tony asks, is there a limit to the number of telescopes or other aircraft that we can put safely into orbit around L2? And while he's thinking about it, is there an exit retirement plan for uh, JWST or is, or is this one this one after it stops being productive? Uh, so I don't know about the retirement plan for, for any of these, actually. Um, I know a lot of the, the there, there is a limitation for uh, things in Earth orbit, especially low Earth orbit, you, you can only have so much uh, junk up there before um, you know things start bumping into each other and and falling apart, and then you get more pieces of junk, and uh, all of a sudden you, you, you can't launch things anymore. Um, L two doesn't have that problem. You can you can put as much stuff there, and uh, you, you're not going to be obstructing uh, new things being launched from Earth. So I I don't think there's any practically any limit that anyone cares about uh, in terms of how much stuff you can you can put in L2, um, not in the way that, that we have a problem with with low Earth orbit. It also yeah. costs a lot to get there, a lot of energy and a lot of money, and uh, so so that expense uh, means that you know there's there's not a heck of a lot of stuff going there, uh, you know even even in the decades to come. So I. I don't think we'll be trying our boundaries there. Is there any international uh, agreements on that? I'm not sure oh, about that. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Matt? It's it's it. Obviously, we're not. We don't seem to think we're going to run into problems, but obviously, in lower space, we are. <laughs> and I guess there's been Bishop. some level of cooperation, but not probably not enough. I know that's I a big part right, of the, uh, the James Webb's halo orbit is actually almost the diameter of the moon. It's huge. Oh, it's a big orbit. So there's plenty of room up there. Oh, yeah. I was just, I was just amused at how uh, slow it's traveling out to L2. That's a big area. Oh, Mike answered think, the question that the JWST primary mission is five years, but has fuel for 10. And after 10, it'll run out of fuel and won't be able to maneuver properly. So I guess there's an, he says there's an option built in that could support robotic servicing, but that's a long way to go for robotic servicing. But let's let it get there first. Well, <laughs> it's got a Landsat, um, I think it's a Landsat 7 port. And what they did is put that on board. So they said, if there's a future robotic mission, they could do something. So it's something they're thinking about. It's on the table, but it's, um, it's just pretty far away. Yeah. And the other thing is it's moving out so slow. 
because yeah. it doesn't have enough propellant to turn around and slow itself down. If it moves out quickly, they're going to coast into spots. Yeah, about a half mile a second, I think. Yep. It really makes sense because this way you don't, they don't have enough propellant to do a lot of things they need it for maneuvering and space station. So um, it makes more sense to go in slow and just kind of slow down there when you get in there as opposed to trying to flip it around and everything you need to do that maneuver. Plus, it's not going to be good for the sun shield to kind of flip it around and try and do that, you know, because there's going to be extra stresses on it. And for all of us excited about James Webb first light and can't wait for it, um, it's still going to take some time, you know, weeks, even months to, to calibrate and, and phase everything uh, before we get, you know, the real good stuff. Um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard six months. So we need a little bit of patience regardless of how fast we get to L2. Well, first image should be about 30 days and then two months for calibration. That but you're right, right, six months until you actually get something good. Yeah, that's what I heard, six months. Yes. Uh, another one. I got to go. Thank you. Yeah, 29 days to get to L2, so. Yep. Jeff, Jeff asked, if all goes well, when would they start constructing the telescope? Uh, so this one, they they actually learned some lessons from James Webb with, with the decadal survey. Uh, they, they, they're they saying they want to slow roll the technology development and they, they want to fund, uh, fund that development for six years before even starting phase A of the mission. Um, and, and once we show that the technology is viable, then they're going to let us, you know, start the real thing, which would be about 2029 or, or thereabouts when would would start work on the mission itself. Is this is this a uh, are there is there any cooperation uh, internationally? I, I expect there will be. Um, so far, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, there's been contributions to the coronagraph development from. Uh, you know, French universities, I, I know for a fact, and I'm sure there's others that I, I haven't given credit to, but you know, other folks worked on those NASA studies, and I, I, I'm sure they'll continue to from, you know, international. But going to be launched by a U.S. rocket. <laughs> <laughs> the decadal <laughs> says, and I, I, I don't have to... Um, you know, put words in their mouths because I, I think I have the copy of it right here. Um, they say that NASA is uniquely suited and that no other um, entity is is capable of, you know, undertaking this mission. So, interesting. Mike, Mike um, is in the chat that if you type in where is web into Google, there is a page that takes you to the tracking. Yeah, I've, uh, I've seen that. It's, uh, it's well past the moon on its way to L2. A very impressive dashboard they have for you. Yeah. Look at the temperatures. Excuse me. So I. I I should mention that, uh, you know, for all your reference, the, the decadal survey report that was released in November, uh, you can all find that online. If you search Astro 2020, um, I'll, I'll do it here just so you can see a decadal survey. You'll uh, come up with a National Academies of Sciences page uh, first thing, and it'll tell you how to get to the full report. And it recommends a lot more than, than just uh, this six meter flagship. Uh, it uh, has recommendations for ground-based astronomy. They wanna keep funding TMT and ELT. Um, has recommendations for smaller missions, uh, probe class and, and explorer class missions. So um, if you search Astro 2020, you can get the full report here and uh, get a feeling of, of what to get excited about in the next 10 years. Matt, you were uh, 
pretty much uh, talking about the mirror. Can can um, is there software on board that modifies the mirror, or do you have to send corrections from the Earth to uh, to modify it as well? Uh, the the plan is to have uh, software on board that's, that's calibrated to um, phase the mirror and. Uh, Unfortunately, there's a, a very con uh, complex control system planned, and, and that may be the only way to do it, to hold everything still. Um, the, the control system includes uh, the pointing of the whole telescope with uh, micro thrusters is, is uh, the best uh, approach there that, that folks have come up with so far. Um, it, it involves... Uh, phasing all of those mirrors together, the, the segments that make up the primary mirror. Um, this report doesn't recommend if the, the mirror be segmented or a monolithic single chunk. So that's something that's up in the air and, and up for discussion, very interesting to think about. But uh, if we've got segments, uh, there's gonna be um, piston and tip and tilt controlled very uh, precisely uh, with uh, actuators and uh, you know, they're going to have to work together with uh, these deformable mirrors, which are you know, also part of the control system, and use the wavefront sensing and control feedback to, to make all these things play together nicely in unison. And uh, same thing with the thermal control system, which also can, you know, cause motions in, in, the, in the telescope. So uh, a lot of moving parts that, uh, you know, they're, they're supposed to... Uh, you know, not move very quickly, but uh, there are uh, a lot of control aspects that, that are really challenging. And you know, maybe, you know, there may be some opportunity to, you know, send the, the control data back down and, and update it and tweak it on the ground, but you get a, uh, it's going to take some iteration and time to, to improve that type of system. Is L3 doing anything as far as the sensors, for example, the uh, sensor chips or uh, CCD kind of stuff or anything like that? Uh, yes, I can say yes. Uh, this is Dave Bishop again. Matt, can you tell me what you're going to be missing at AAS this year? Well, I was uh, supposed to be in Utah now for, for AAS, but um, a lot of those sessions, we're not going to be missing them. They're just going to be pushed to the uh, summer session of, of AAS. So we'll, we'll just be patient. That's good. That's uh, there's good. a few things that they're going to do anyways next week. There's a exoplanet um, group uh, meeting. There's a... Uh, um, NASA town hall, I think, with Paul Hertz next week. Uh, so you could you could look up. Uh, there's a few events that are still taking place virtually, um, if if anyone's interested. Yeah, I think uh, AAS opened that up so for public um, viewing as well. All right, any other questions? Well, Matt, thank you so much for coming in and uh, showing us, uh, giving us an update. This is pretty a pretty interesting project. The fact that I didn't, I didn't, uh, wasn't aware they could actually take a couple of different plans and ask to combine them into one, uh, a whole different uh, um, project, which is kind of interesting how that happened. That's, uh, that's amazing that that could happen. Well, thanks so much for doing that. Uh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm glad to join you all and uh, you know, hopefully get to join you in person sometime uh, you know, not too long from now. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thanks again, Matthew. You're welcome. Good night. Thank you. All right. I, I would invite anybody if you wanted to hang out for a minute or two and talk. Glad to have you hang out for a minute or two. It's up to you guys if you want to. Thanks to Matt. Can entertain questions about what we've got coming up. 
in event wise, or you guys want to just uh, shoot the breeze? Thank you for inviting. Oh, glad to have you guys. Glad you came, Mike. Mike and Devin, both from uh, Buffalo Astronomical Association, and I think we're going to uh, uh, we're going to cooperate in a couple of meetings. Matt, Mike and I have exchanged emails, and I think that uh, in June, actually, we are going to uh, they're going to they're going to visit our meeting, and then we're going to visit their meeting because we have to, we happen to meet at uh, the opposite weeks. I think they meet on Wednesdays, we meet on Fridays, and so for our June meeting. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about each of our facilities. So we'll we'll show the Buffalo Astronomical Association what what we have at our facility and how we use it, and they'll do the same for us in, in June as well. So that'll be an, uh, a fun uh, a fun cooperation between the two the two clubs. So looking forward to doing that. Yeah, we meet on Fridays, so oh, we so meet, you meet next on Fridays. Week. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, we meet next week. So it's not yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Right. So I was planning on going to the uh, winter star party. It would have been my first winter star party. Paid my paid for my, for my way to go, and I was all set to go. Going to go be camping in a in a uh, in a tow behind trailer. Planning my trip down, I got an email two days ago that it's canceled because of COVID. <laughs> oh, say it ain't so, Mark. Oh. Wow. I am just going to be living vicariously through you. I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken. That stinks. I know I talked talked to a bunch of you last month that I was going to be going, and I figured I'd let you know that it's it's not going to happen. Unfortunately, just sad. I just very sad. My hands up in the air. What are you going to do? So I will, uh, at the end of this meeting, in fact, I will uh, stop recording it.